Welcome to episode two of our generally spooky mini series all about witchcraft in Scotland. Ooh, really? Yeah. Have you come here straight from episode one? Because we told you to. We told you to, and we are. Yeah. We just finished recording like half an hour ago. We had a snack. We had a snack, had a little break, had a mm-hmm. jammy piece. It was very tasty. Mm-hmm. A bit of sugar. Mm-hmm. Watched some TikToks for a bit. Yep. It, it was fun. It's like quarter past 11, so it's like pitch black outside. Mm-hmm. Pr- prime spook weather. It is prime spook weather. Mm-hmm. You are correct. I'm also quite chilly, so I'm going to get a jumper. <laughs> we just started. I know. Well, the lovely people listening can listen to the intro music. Oh, I can't. You'll be pleased to hear that Kieran is now wrapped up. Cozy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm comfortable. I'm cozy. I'm ready to be spooked. It feels like we're breaking the law because we're recording so late. I know. It's quarter past eleven. Quarter past eleven is a Thursday. Isn't it? I know. Dun, dun, dun. Look at us rebelling. I know. Since we have no one, like we're not beholden to anyone, we work on our own schedules. Yeah, and this is our project. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, for those of you who listened to the first episode, I have a, a quick housekeeping because I mentioned Aqua Tofana at the end of the last episode. You did. You and did. because it was only half an hour ago for me, I just looked up more about the story. <laughs> so, Wikipedia. Aqua Tofana was a strong poison that was reputedly widely used in Naples, Perugia, and Rome in Italy. So, I was correct, it is a European country. Yep. During the early 17th century, Julia Tefana, a woman from Palermo, made a good business for over 20 years, selling her large production, she employed several helpers, of Aqua Tefana to would-be widows. Do you think she knows David Fuck Tefano? <laughs> <laughs> That's an inside joke, nobody's going to get that. <laughs> but yeah, apparently she, uh, she killed over 600 people. Wow, good work. Over 600 victims are alleged to have died from this poison, mostly abusive husbands, in a time when women did not have any rights or protection. It is mostly. So, you know, well maybe it says mostly because it's difficult to prove sometimes. That's true. Yeah, you shouldn't have to prove it, you should just trust what abuse victims tell you, but mm. I wonder if that's why it's mostly. Well, I suppose Over you can... 600 people. Yeah, that's wild. It's good work. Oh, she was executed in July 1659. Yeah. Which is funny because our story today takes place in 1662, oh. which is only three years later. That is quite funny. We are putting these things together. Yeah, this isn't the podcast yet. This is just picking up the pieces of a story that I poorly told in the last episode that was annoying me. Well, you indulge me by letting me look up <laughs> <laughs> the thing about priests. You did. I did. So you did look it up, and I did let you do that. Yeah. So it's only fair. <laughs> Maybe not the people listening who have to put up with our shite. I know. Such shite. Sorry. <laughs> well, yeah. This is this is our mini series about Scottish witchcraft through history. Last episode, episode one, we talked about Agnes Sampson and the North Berwick witch trials. So I would recommend that you listen to that one first. If for some reason you're jumping in straight at episode two, because there may be some details and things that I'll, I I won't repeat in this episode. I won't explain again because I've explained it in the first episode. So it would make more sense if you what if you listen to these one, two, then three. And we better establish which which is which. <sighs> so who are we talking about today? Help wanted. <laughs> co-host of podcast (laughs) (laughs) must have good sense of humour oh savage (laughs) (laughs) that was my Halloween joke when I was like 8 years old you have told me this one before it's a very cute story yeah I'm not even sure I got it when I was telling it (laughs) (laughs) you got it this time though well yeah 
the only time I can ever use that joke in context. That is very true. Your opportunities are kind of limited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so who are we talking about today? Well, last episode, we were in the late 1500s. Yes. This week, we're jumping through history about... Hun- Was this week? Not this week. This episode? This episode... So used to the normal season <laughs> setup. This episode, we're jumping through about 100 years of history to the mid-late 1600s, mm. like I said. Uh, the 1660s, to be precise. Ooh. But I have been super excited about this story because this story, which is especially relevant because it's really dark outside and it's late at night, this only happened five miles away from where we're sitting right now. Yeah, it did. Five miles away. Like five to eight miles away. It's like living in history. Do you want some going through history time music? No. Oh, <laughs> this episode we are going to be talking about Isabel Gaudi mm-hmm. from Aldern and her infamous confessions. Ooh. And these confessions have shaped the way that modern day academics debate the witch hunts and the witch trials. Oh my god. She is she is a big deal yeah. if you're looking at witchcraft throughout history. This story is a biggie. And it happened right around the corner. I know. Outside the yard. Mm-hmm. Ooh. So excited. I'm, act- I'm actually, like, buzzing. I wonder if there's any sort of memorial or, like, something in Old Aaron. I don't know a if there's a memorial to her. There's a memorial to a battle that happened there oh. that we could visit. I don't know about a memorial to her, though. I mean, that's fair. Curious. Don't know. We can look into it. Hmm. So yeah, if you haven't listened to our first witchcraft episode, go back and have a listen to that first, just because there might be some things I reference, such as glancingly, that mm-hmm. I've explained in full in episode one. It'll be better in order, just just trust me, just yeah. trust me. And if you're enjoying it, leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts. That's if, a really good segue. If that's where you listen to your podcast. Yes, because it really helps. It's, yeah. a, it's a big thing, getting ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts. Weirdly, because I can track, like, charts, and we got a review from Finland, and instantly went into, like, the history chart Aww. of Apple Podcasts in Finland. Thank you, yeah. whoever did that. Not a written one, like a, a stars one. Yeah, but that's still really nice to take the time to do that. Well, yeah, it, it really, really helps. So, yeah, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts right now, just hit pause for, like, a second. I, I won't talk. I'll no, give you, I'll give you a pause. minute. Like, I won't say anything. You go and just leave a rating. Yeah. Just hit the hit the stars. Yeah. You don't even have to say anything. Nope. Right, okay. You don't need any more time now. Let's be real. Come on. Come on. <laughs> so like I said, we're leaving Agnes Sampson about a hundred years in the past and jump into the mid sixteen hundreds. Yes. Where we meet Isabel Gaudi. I've heard of her. She's either completely illiterate or a well educated daughter of a solicitor. <laughs> and she was either a young thing in her early twenties. Or a seasoned woman of the world in her 50s. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of scope there, isn't there? Yeah, if you can't tell, not a lot is known about Isabel. Ugh. She's a bit of an enigma up until she married her husband, who is a man called John Gilbert. So we, we don't know how old she was. We don't know when she was born. Hmm. I've had I've read different accounts of like the type of person she was, because one thing I read said she was really well-educated and was sort of sick of the life that she led and another one said she was like completely illiterate couldn't read or write or anything who knows i, I don't she was a ra- she was raised in the area around aldern and she knew it pretty well she lived there her whole life and like i said accounts differ but it seems like isabel wasn't exactly in a happy marriage mm-hmm. so she married john gilbert like i said and they moved to loch Loy which is about two miles outside Aldern. Okay. And from what I read, the loch used to be a lot bigger than it is now, hmm. but you can still go there. There's a guest house, I think. Oh. Global warming be like. <laughs> <laughs> but they moved there because John was a cotter, which meant that he was kind of like a farmhand. So hmm. he worked a portion of land that the local laird owned in return for living in his home. 
So John was given a house to live in okay. while he laboured on the land that oh, he didn't own. So that's what he did. Uh-huh. So it's likely that Isabel's day-to-day life really wasn't the most interesting, if that was his job. But it sort of, she was taken up with doing the things you kind of expect, like taking care of the house, mm-hmm. helping out with stuff around the farm, you know, like milking animals. Yep. Uh, probably probably mending clothes. You know you know the type of thing. Yeah. That kind of stuff. But if she was a farmhand's farmhand. If she was helping her husband. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can see why she might not have been satisfied just with life in general, if that was the case. Because I feel like a lot of women in particular would have been in her situation where mm. she's in a marriage that she's not thrilled about living a life that isn't very exciting and is really hard work Mm -hmm. is very mundane but that's if she was actually unhappy she might not have been but in 1662 her life was turned completely upside down and it would be partly of her own making Uh oh because isabel gaudi would find herself confessing at length on four different occasions to being a witch. Confessing at length. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So she was Gabby. Gowdy. <laughs> <laughs> Fun Gabby. <laughs> it happens, rarely. Mm. So in the time between Agnes Sampson's trial and Isabel Gowdy's confessions, a lot had changed in Scotland. So this is why I'm saying you should listen to these in order, because then you'll know what I'm talking about. I feel the people will. Yeah, I think so. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. I would. So last episode, we were talking about King James. And you might remember I mentioned that he had a son, Charles. Yes. So he became King Charles I. Notorious loony. Yes, when he became king. Mm -hmm. But King Charles I was beheaded. Mm. You remember? Yep. Because he he was a tyrant. He was a really bad king. So the people killed him. But several decades have passed since then. And now King Charles I's son is on the throne in Scotland. Okay, yeah, yeah. So King Charles II was crowned in Scotland in 1660. Mm. Do you think he sung the I just can't wait to be king song? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> or something similar. <laughs> but... Th- Basically, the point I'm making is there's been a lot of upheaval because when King Charles I was beheaded and not king anymore, there was a period of time where there there was no monarchy, there was no king. And eventually, King Charles II was restored, which is known as the Restoration. He was made king again. Mm-hmm. And it started in Scotland and then he became king of England and Ireland well, okay. later. So that's that's kind of where we're at. Mm-hmm. Things have moved on. But it's a huge time of upheaval. And what do you think happens in times of upheaval? Um, you hunt some witches. You do, you (laughs) hunt some witches. (laughs) So I just said King Charles II was crowned in Scotland in 1660. And you remember that I mentioned Isabel is confessing to witchcraft in 1662. That's quite turned red. This isn't an accident. This is direct cause and effect. In times of upheaval, war, just economic downturns where people don't really know what's going on, Mm -hmm. witch hunts go up. It it happened several times throughout history. And this is part of the reason people think that there were the five great Scottish witch hunts. Oh, yeah. Because they happened in times where things were a bit shaky. Mm -hmm. Understatement. The period between 1661 and 1662 was the fifth of the great Scottish witch hunts. So it was the last. I mentioned last time that the North Berwick witch hunts were part of an earlier one. Mm -hmm. So this is the last of the the big witch hunts that happened across the entire country. Then what's episode three going to be? You're going to have to wait and see. (laughs) Unless these are already out and you can just read the title. (laughs) (laughs) Now, I'm going to try and keep things as simple and easy to follow as I can. Because when you start talking about monarchy and religion, it can get complicated very quickly. Mm -hmm. So, tell me if it doesn't make sense. During the English Civil War... I'm confused. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> but I haven't even started. <laughs> English Civil War. Mm. This is what led to King Charles being beheaded. Okay. I think. Or being restored. Restored. I forget. But basically during the Civil War, Presbyterian Christianity had a major boom. And we talked about Presbyterianism last time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just, it's very strict. It's very scripture heavy sect of Protestantism. There's not a lot of wiggle room for just having a good time. And they really emphasize God as sovereign over everything and everyone. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what they believe in. They're very solid and faith dictates their entire life. So this had a major boom, um, during the civil war you know people turn into faith mm -hmm. but the difference between england and the highlands where isabel lived where we now live is that presbyterianism took longer to really have an impact up here mm. compared to other places so a lot of traditional highland folklore and traditions and superstitions lingered and a lot of people still believed in them rather than committing fully to the Presbyterian faith. Some people were mm -hmm. Presbyterian. You know, it's fine. But it wasn't as far-reaching. Does that make sense? Oh, that makes sense. Presbyterian ministers did live in the Highlands and they did not like the superstitions mm. or people who practiced the old ways of living or the old ways of healing. Mm. And on top of that, the Laird who owned Isabel's husband's farm was called the Laird of Park. And he was just deadly opposed to anything to do with folklore or superstition. He hated it. He hated witchcraft, everything. And with good reason, apparently, because it was recorded publicly that the Laird's father, grandfather and uncle were all killed by witchcraft. Well, that would put you off. That was the that was the legitimate reason stated for their deaths. Hmm. So it's definitely not the best family history. No. I wonder what happened to them. You might be safer with like asthma <laughs> <laughs> or like webbed feet or something. <laughs> but yeah, I I don't know. I couldn't find exactly what they died of. Hmm. I didn't look into it too much. But that was what the story was, that they had all been killed by witches. That's so the Laird of Park hated anything to do mm -hmm. with superstition i wonder as well you were saying uh they were anti like traditional healers and things mm -hmm. they wanted the new ways i wonder what the new ways were shut up and die <laughs> maybe or maybe just a trust in faith oh a fair faith healing religious healing maybe maybe like trusting your minister mm. i really don't know i'm not sure because i know that that ministers were turned to for a lot and like healing through prayer. Yeah, well, it wasn't quite it wasn't quite time for doctors yet, I don't think. But like things like chanting and mm. rituals were a big no no. But can you see where I'm going with all of this? I can see I can see how we're heading for trouble. Yeah. Isabel was ba Isabel was basically living in the middle of a perfect storm that spelled trouble for women who didn't fit in with their community. Which is a story that we've heard before. Yep. And she had a particular problem with the Laird of Park. So he's the one who owns her house. Yeah, just that he was an asshole. Well, apparently he tried to start a sexual relationship with her. And she didn't want him to. Mm -hmm. So naturally he took that rejection and decided that that made her a ter terrible person. Naturally, naturally. So he started badmouthing her to everybody. Oh. Saying what a terrible person she was. Including the local minister. Because she didn't want to have sex with him. Uh, Guys, sort it out. Come on. Now. Sort it out. And to add insult to injury, he stopped taking care of the farmhouse that she lived in. So, you know, he's the landlord, he owns it, so he has to maintain it. Mm -hmm. And he just stopped. So no repairs, no care, no maintenance, no nothing. Just a dick, basically. Yeah, so that's kind of the situation that she's in. She's in this marriage, this very simple life, and generally doesn't seem very happy. Mm -hmm. No one can really decide why, but on the 13th of April, 1662, 
Isabel Gowdy made her first confession of being a witch. Oh. And no one knows why. Well, no one knows why. I'll get into it a bit, but nobody really knows what pushed her to do this. Mm. From the transcript of the confession, I managed to find the transcripts of the first two, which have been translated from Scots into sort of modern day English. Mm -hmm. I couldn't find the other two. But it sounds like she and other people from around Aldern were captured or arrested. Like she makes references to like being taken and uh. we've been taken, so it's not just her. Mm-hmm. But what makes all of this different to Agnes Sampson's experience that we talked about is that in April, I think of that year, of 1662, the law had changed oh. surrounding the treatment of people being suspected of being a witch. So... I'm assuming it just gets much worse. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. If a person made a confession of being a witch uh-huh. under torture, they couldn't be found guilty. Oh. It was no longer legal to torture someone into confessing to witchcraft. Well, it took, you know, it took 130 years from the original law coming out, but it's good, it's good benefit. Unless the Privy Council gave authorization to do this. That was fine, apparently. Mm. But generally, you couldn't torture someone into saying they were a witch. Mm. Progress. I mean, it's going in the right direction. But this makes it even more confusing. Isabel Gowdy was not tortured. Yeah, she just went for it. I mean, can you really trust a council named after a toilet? (laughs) Kieran, with the hard facts and difficult truths. (laughs) 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 This is what he brings to the podcast. Variety. <laughs> so Isabel gave four different confessions mm. with more detail than just about any other witchcraft confession ever. Mm. Ever. Yeah. With no torture involved. Oh, well, I do you think she found some funky mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> Having a good time. <laughs> but that's not to say that the conditions she was kept in, or the conditions she... Yeah, the conditions she was kept in were pleasant. They Mm -hmm. weren't five star or anything. Chances are she was kept in total isolation. So, uh, what's it called? Solitary confinement, Mm. which can mess with your head big time. Well, I suppose there's a a kind of, I imagine they can take quite a loose interpretation Mm -hmm. of what torture is. Exactly. So, she may have been deprived of sleep. Yeah. Because, you know, they could just be loud. Yeah. Well, she could just be kept somewhere so unpleasant she can't sleep. Yeah. So we're not going to torture you, we're just going to throw you in this room and not feed you for the next seven days. Mm-hmm. You know, that kind of stuff. But the the awful kind of torture we were talking about last episode, mm-hmm. you couldn't do that unless you had permission. Yeah, the physical torture. Well, I suppose there was, like, there wouldn't be much understanding of, like, mental torture. No, not really. So to speak. Not the way that we understand it. Yeah. Although if you're interested in like the psychological effects of things like that or of solitary confinement, uh-huh. then you should look up the Reykjavik Confessions. Mm-hmm. That happened in the 70s. Ooh. And the police there kept suspects in solitary confinement for like over a year. Holy shit. And had them confessing to things that they couldn't have done. It's so interesting when you think about the psychology of it. Wild. The Reykjavik Confessions. Mm. It's really interesting. No, I thought you were going to say, if you're interested in mentally torturing people. (laughs) Then call me. uh... (laughs) No, 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 no. Just the psychology behind what solitary confinement can do to your brain. Yeah. Um, That's a really good example of that. And I think they use that as a case study when they're teaching about interrogation tactics and things. Mm -hmm. Because it was was pretty bad. Uh, It sounds pretty bad. But you know, that's 1970s. We are 1660s. Yep. The 60s. <laughs> no, it's not the same. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, in Isabel's case, the council, they basically sent a note. They were sending letters back and forth about Isabel being tried as a witch. So letters being sent back and forth and back and forth. And the council sent a letter saying that she could only be guilty if the confessions had been volunteered without torture that they were sane and without a wish to die. Hmm. So all of hmm. these things had to happen for her to be found guilty. So that's a big step. That is. That's, that's pretty good. In her first confession, Isabel startled and just 
enthralled everyone who listened. <laughs> and she gave her confession to, it was a group of men, but they were all important men from the area. Mm-hmm. I think the Laird was one of them that she had the problem with, but there was the minister and I think there was the sheriff and all all kinds of people. And like she just talked for so long and she gave so much detail. It's just mental. Reading it was one of the most interesting things I've ever done. And I've kind of paraphrased it rather than just, like, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I'll leave a link for show notes mm-hmm. where you can find what I read. But it's incredibly interesting. Um, she told them that she had met the devil while walking between farms, like from one to another. That was when she met the devil for the first time. And he spoke to her and she promised to meet him at Aldern Church when night fell, which she says she then did. And she said that when she met the devil, she denied and renounced her baptism, denying her Christian faith. Uh, She said she, quote, put one of her hands on the crown of her head. So I don't know if you want to like. I can do that. And the other to the sole of her foot. That's quite tricky. Yeah. Well, I'm saying down so it's easier for me. And renounced all between her two hands to the devil. Oh. <laughs> was it, what's, what's the significance of that? But uh, that makes sense. From the top of her head to the soles of her feet now belong to the devil. Oh. And she was his servant. Hmm. And then she said that the devil marked her on her shoulder. Well, I'm glad. I'm just thinking, Blythe didn't say repeat after me. <laughs> no. No, no, no. <laughs> so this is an example of a witch being given the devil's mark oh, which yeah, we talked yeah. about last time mm. so she claims that he marked her on her shoulder and this is a bit gross but he sucked blood out of it and then she says that he spat this blood into his hand and sprinkled it on her head Hmm. Rebaptizing her in his name. Uh, so it's pretty grim. It's pretty grim. Pretty grim. As far as things go. Pretty grim. Isabel described what the devil looked like in great detail, mm-hmm. saying that he was big he was a big, dark, hairy man, very cold. Sometimes he had boots and sometimes shoes in his feet, but his feet were always forked and cloven. Mm-hmm. I mean, it started off as my description. <laughs> Big, dark. Oh, well, you know, you have blonde hair. That's true. Well, just could be a nightmare. Big, hairy man. Big, hairy man. Cold. Who's chilly. Man. Cold. <laughs> <laughs> There's like one particularly like shocking and horrible detail. Mm-hmm. That I don't really want to say on the podcast, but I could tell you. You, you can tell me. We could like try and bleep it out yeah. while I say it. I can edit it. Out. It might be funny with a bleep, <laughs> if we can get a bleep. I don't know how to bleep. Oh. We, uh, it might be worth looking into. But basically, you know, she said that he was really cold. Mm-hmm. Well, she was saying that they had sex, and when he... Oh. <laughs> See, I don't want to say that. Oh. I mean, it's good detail. <laughs> I wish I could... Show your face. <laughs> yeah. It sort of sucked a lemon. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, she went she went into detail. And she detailed the many acts of rebellion and chaos that she and other members of her coven got up to. Mm. It's not just her. She gave names. And these things included things like raising an unchristened child from the grave. Ooh. Mm-hmm. And that's like... That's the nice version. Yeah. That she goes into more detail that's a bit more grim than that. Uh, stealing food and drink from houses in the area. Mm. And I thought this was gross, but this might make you laugh. That she explained that when they stole drink from barrels, you know, they would use their witchy powers mm-hmm. to steal the drink. And then they would replace it by peeing in the barrel. <laughs> <laughs> so that people wouldn't know there was anything missing. <laughs> Which for some reason, like, it's gross, but for some reason it reminded me of what my dad used to do with blocks of marzipan. Did he pee on the marzipan? No, 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 no. It's just, it's one of those daft things. But this is in the long, long ago when you could buy a block of marzipan and it was wrapped like a, like a stick of butter. Mm. 
in foil and my dad loves marzipan just he's a fiend my granny used to buy it because she would use it to make christmas cake oh yeah if you don't know christmas cake traditionally here anyway is a fruit cake and then there's a layer of marzipan around that Mm -hmm. and then you put the royal icing on the outside it's a good time so she would buy her block of marzipan and because it was wrapped in the foil my dad would unwrap it really really carefully and like cut a little bit off but then fold it back so it looked like it was still there oh very nice and he got so good at it that he managed to eat the block and fold it back as if there was still a full block there that is good work so then when my granny went to use it she crushed the foil (laughs) in her hand and there was nothing there (laughs) (laughs) then she was like ah what happened i was like oh wow that's weird oh witches came in (laughs) it's not strange and that's what it reminded me of. That's good work. Which isn't related to the story, <laughs> but it's a funny story, it's a I fun think. fun story, fun addition. Mm-hmm. Isabel also described flying around the night sky on the backs of horses that you know could fly. She talked about being able to fly on strands of straw. I mean, I'd be up for a while. That sounds fun. Being able to shoot people with pieces of straw. Oh. If... They didn't bless themselves, things like that. So she goes she goes into a lot of detail. And usually, like with the last episode, I didn't really go into the details of the confessions because mm-hmm. to me, usually, the confessions are just... like it, It's part of that accused person's pain because mm-hmm. they've been forced to say it. So I don't really want to repeat everything they were no. forced to say because it's not true. Don't want to give it air time. But the whole uniqueness of this story are her confessions. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to get into the stories that she chose to tell. Because it's different in my head. Well, it's it's bizarre. Why is she... What? Do you get the difference? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because with Agnes, I didn't really feel the need to go into everything she confessed to because she was tortured for weeks. Well, there's not anything directly interesting in hearing what someone said under torture no because it's just on lies well just pain well yeah but this is different like the, the her confessions are quite incredible yeah so she goes on and she said that she and her coven wanted revenge on the laird of park now remember he's listening to this she is telling this to him yeah and he's the man who owns her farm and has basically been a shit And she said that they decided to get their revenge by casting spells to kill all of his sons, therefore destroying his family line. So they created a clay image of his children, so like a little clay figure. Mm -hmm. And it's just one, I think. And, quote, put its face near the fire until it shriveled with the heat. Then they put it amongst the hot embers until it glowed red like a coal. And... Last episode, we were talking about the likelihood of coincidence leading to oh, yeah. conviction. All of the Laird's sons died before they became adults. Oh, shit. Some of the younger ones didn't make it to six months old, oh. which which was fairly common. Infant mortality yeah. was really high. Mm-hmm. That's a thing. But all of his sons died. Whoa. So it's interesting that we were talking about whether coincidences would happen that people yeah. had the intent but the thing happened anyway separately um, well yeah it's not necessarily because they did anything mm-hmm. or isn't so this could be a case of that mm. that's my stomach <laughs> <laughs> I, had a, I had a jam sandwich <laughs> jammy peas jammy peas uh, I was saying it for the benefit of people who might not know what a jammy piece is well they should learn not everybody like, takes a piece for their lunch oh pardon me does make sense to everybody well it should (laughs) okay well now they know you deserve that (laughs) that's because you're being rude why did i don't know being rude (laughs) (laughs) you have too much power me another thing that isabel talked at length about was meeting the king and queen of the fairies Hmm. which it is probably a widely accepted phrase i don't know if it's just a scottish thing to be away with the fairies I don't know. But like, if you don't know, you probably do. If you don't, if you're away with the fairies, you're kind of 
in a world of your own. Mm-hmm. You're not really concentrating. Or like it might be a way you describe someone who's a bit off the wall. A bit doolally. If you're away with the fairies. Mm-hmm. But fairy lore and stories about fairy people are a huge part of Scottish folklore. It's an ancient story and Mm -hmm. they're an ancient legend fairly common (laughs) but it's not they aren't the way that you would think they're not like a disney fairy if you're talking about fairies in terms of scottish folklore they can be quite dangerous oh yeah they're they're quite changeable Mm -hmm. You can't really depend on how they're going to react. If you get on their wrong side, bad things will happen to you. Um, In some stories, the fairies leave like gifts at your window or at your door, but you're not supposed to take them Mm. because then you're kind of... Any communication with them is a bad thing. Like There's there's lots of things that exist about the fairies. Uh, one, One of them is that you're supposed to refer to them as like the good folk... Mm-hmm. and refer to them with nice names otherwise bad things will happen to you so her saying that she met the king and queen of the fairies isn't idyllic and just yeah. beautiful it's it's quite powerful she's not hanging out with tinkerbell or fairy godmother no no not exactly so i wanted to make that distinction yeah that's how fairies are again in terry pratchett oh yeah i'm pretty sure is that uh, the wee free men yes because the I'm pretty sure the Pictsies, yeah, <laughs> the wee blue and orange-haired fairy folk are like guardians against the fairies or something like that in that trilogy. <clears throat> it's been a while. Well, there's loads of fairy legends. I want to do an episode on it, mm. but like changelings, that's a legend about fairy mm. people, where you <clears throat> you might have your child swapped out for a fairy child. And the fairies have taken your good child and left you with a an ill-behaved fairy baby. Weird. <clears throat> so in her confession, Isabel said, I was in the Downy Hills, which I think is near Angus. I think it's further east. Mm-hmm. Where's Aberdeen? Yeah, I think. And was dined there by the Queen of Fairy. More food than I could eat. The Queen of Fairy is finely clothed in white linens and brown and white clothes, etc., the King of Fairy is a fine-looking man, well-built and broad-faced, etc. And there were elf bulls rollicking and roistering up and down and they scared me. Hmm. So that's directly from her confession. That was what she said. Crazy. Mm-hmm. What I thought was interesting... Well, firstly, it's it's kind of a shame because in the transcript it says etc. And that's what the scribe wrote at the time of the confessions. And it's what the scribe would do if it if what Isabel was saying was just deemed irrelevant or things they weren't interested in. Yeah. They just didn't write it down. But so what? we could have we could have learnt so much more if they had been thorough. But the, sometimes they would do it if they just couldn't keep up with what she was saying or things yeah. like that. So I didn't cut things out there. That's that's yeah. what's in the document. Weird. But what's interesting is that before the North Berwick witch hunts happened, so pre fifteen ninety, yeah, just saying that you had anything to do with the fairies was enough to cast suspicion on you for being a witch. Oh, okay. So which was enough to put you to death. Yes. So this is very serious. If you say that you've you've met the fairies, you work with the fairies, uh-huh. then you know you you're a witch. But after the North Berwick witch hunts the people who were hunting witches weren't as interested in that. Like, if you said something like that, they didn't really care in the same way. No. They were more concerned with finding witches who were working with the devil. Oh, well, that makes sense. That was what they wanted, and that's what they wanted in confessions. Mm -hmm. They didn't really care about the fairy stuff anymore. So it's interesting that when Isabel gets into all these descriptions about the, the good folk they don't pay any heed because it doesn't fit what they want her to say. No, they're 
They're interested in all the devil shit. Yeah, that's what they want to know. So they're kind of... It seems like they're kind of leading her where they want her to go. Yeah. Because after this in the transcript, she starts talking about things that are completely different. So it seems like they've hinted to her anyway that, no, 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 you need to tell us about this. You Mm -hmm. need to tell us about how you're working with the devil. That's what we want to know. Yep. That's what you need to confess to. Interesting. It's, it is interesting, isn't it? That like, no, you're we we're not we don't care if you're that kind of witch. Yeah, we need to know if you're this kind of witch. Well, it's not even like a oh, why are you? That doesn't make sense. You're lying. Stop mm-hmm. telling stories. It's a you can hang out with the fairy king queen all you want. We don't give a shit. Kinda, yeah. Which is weird because like the hundred years before, that was bad enough for you to be killed. Yeah. But we talked about that last episode that. The goalposts are always changing and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable is kind of arbitrary. Mm-hmm. Still is arbitrary, but oh, yeah. in this context, it's it's interesting when you look at how it changes. Yeah, absolutely. So if all this wasn't enough, and remember, this is still the first confession. We haven't got through them all. Oh, man. <laughs> four? Jesus. Five? Four. One of the reasons that Isabel's confessions are so infamous and were so infamous at the time is that she included a great deal of sexual activity Good gracious. happening between her and the devil. And she went into detail. <laughs> <laughs> so like the details I saw that it seems silly because I'm a grown woman. I don't really want to get into them. I think they're like a bit rude. It's a bit risky. I mean, blushing. <laughs> so imagine how people reacted to this in 1662. Yeah. Why isn't her husband there been like, hey, excuse me, <laughs> can you stop fucking the devil six ways to Sunday? Oh, yeah. Like, you, you know how people would react to it now? Mm-hmm. When you think about it 400 years ago and she's saying this to a group of influential men, mm-hmm. just, you know, in, in as much detail as she feels like. It's almost an act of rebellion in itself, looking them yeah. in the eye and telling them about all of this stuff. Especially when one of them wanted to start a sexual relationship with her. Yeah, like, it, it's just, it took balls. <laughs> <laughs> Big hairy devil balls. Yeah, which she would know. <laughs> so yeah, her confession was completely outrageous and sensational. And she's apparently the reason that the word coven continue to be used in reference to witches in witch trials. And I think she was the first person to make reference to her coven having 13 people in it, Mm. which became kind of an accepted fact about witches, that covens were made of 13 witches. So that came from her. So that's how big a deal this was. But then she did it all again (laughs) on the 3rd of May. Oh. Right? That's wild. So the first one, hang on, let me check. The first one 13th was... 13th of April? I think. I need to know, though. Yeah, my brain's trying to make a joke about a bun in the coven. <laughs> I can't, can't get anywhere with it. Yeah, 13th of April was the first one. This next one is the 3rd of May. So, like, two weeks later? Uh, yeah, two, three, maybe. Jeez, oh. So this time, she's presented to the same group <laughs> of men... And I wonder if they just stopped her, like, oh, right, that's that's enough, we're out. We're all a bit green in the face, you're just spouting all this shite, we're just... I have a boner. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah we just, we're all going to go and jack off now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just call it for today. And she's like, I want to go again, they're like, no, it's too soon, we don't want to hear it. That's oh, but, plenty. But I'm, I'm chomping at the bit, like, I want to tell you, I've got this, I've got my confession ready, like... Okay, fucking fine. What do you have to say? (laughs) (laughs) Fucking (laughs) fine. Or because no one else swears as much as I do, they said, oh, fine. (laughs) (laughs) This time, she recited in full 27 benevolent and malevolent chants that she and the other witches in her coven used either to heal or to harm. 27? 27. I mean... That's a lot to have to either make up or have pre prepared. Mm-hmm. Weird. Right? And they were good and bad. So some of them were for healing, some of them were 
like curses and hexes. Some of them, she said that there's one in particular I saw just on the Wikipedia page that someone's written out that will transform her into a hare. <sighs> and 27 of them. Do you want to try and churn that one? No. And I'll report on what happens? No. I'm not taking the I don't trust you. I'm not taking the risk. We have a dog in the house. He'll eat me. <laughs> Even though I'm his mum, he will eat me. If you turn into a hare. Yeah. I'll put you in some stew. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but although she recited all of these, it was similar to the issue that the scribes had with her talking about the fairies. Only three of these chants were transcribed. Oh. And to a point, it seems like they just got sick of hearing the same thing over and over and over again. So they just didn't they didn't write it down. And because it not, wasn't what they wanted to convict her of a crime. Well, actually, that's not the information they needed. And there was no need to be thorough. I'm surprised they wrote any of it down, mm-hmm. to be honest. Like, when you said some of them were recorded, you know, it was just two of the four. Three? Oh, oh th- the confessions. I thought you meant the chants. I know, I'm, like, I'm surprised anyone thought to write it down well they wrote it down because the confessions had to be sent to the privy council oh yeah you mentioned that they had to well i'll get into it a bit more later but basically they had to send down their case mm-hmm. and they had to ask if they could hold a trial so they had to send all of their evidence down to edinburgh and then they would get the yay or nay mm-hmm. whether they could try this person as a witch she's not being tried yet she's confessing which is different Oh, but she's still held, presumably. Yes, because yes. she's suspected of the crime. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? That does make sense. So with the transcription being incomplete, the other reason for that is, remember I said that some of these chants were benevolent. Mm-hmm. They, were for, <clears throat> they were for healing. So it wasn't useful to their criminal case to hear about how Isabel and the other, wirch- how Isabel and the other witches were working to heal people in their community. Oh, that's true, eh? And I read a great description of this. I can't remember exactly where. I've got the list of all my sources, but I can't remember which one this came from. But it said, Perhaps the Calvinist commissioners got tired of listening to their confessing witch recite Catholic folk cures. Their interest was in the witch as destroyer, not healer, and possibly Isabel was moved on to more interesting topics. Mm. Which makes sense. It does make sense. What does Calvinist mean? It is a like branch of Christianity. Oh, okay. Which is really all you need to know for this mm-hmm. discussion. But yeah, they're, they're the commissioners, so they have to send a commission down to the council to get permission to have a trial. Which is why they're writing all this down. God, yeah. Presumably, if they didn't get permission, they'd have to release her. Yes. But this isn't all Isabel told them. So she recited all 27 of these chants and told them what they were for, what she did with them. But she also told them that there were 13 members of her coven. Mm -hmm. Like I said, this was in the second confession that she said this. Yep. She told them that she had a spirit guide called the Red Reaver who always dressed in black. And then she gave like a an itemised list of everyone in her coven, what their nickname was, and who their spirit guide was. <laughs> for, for all of or almost all of them. can't remember if it was all 13. But that goes on for ages. She told them that she and her coven had power over the wind and could control it at will and gave the chant for doing so. But couldn't do anything about the rain. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was interesting. Yeah, that's a shame. Her and Gandalf. Can't <laughs> help it. It will rain until the rain is done. <laughs> <laughs> I was just imagining her giving these 27 chants and saying it was the same thing over and over. Like, oh yeah, but now you give the chant and you lean to the left. And her just going through this like 10 minute chant and then being like, can you just skip to the next one? No, no, don't be hasty. <laughs> You've got to do it right. Okay, and now we have the same again, but I put a hand on my cheek, and then she just starts again. Well, it's a different chant each time, but they follow a similar rhythm. Well, that makes sense. So it's it's different words and different rhymes, but from what I could see, they're similar in structure. Mm-hmm. 
is well, what I, I meant. I think it'd be funnier. That way. <laughs> it would be. It would be funnier. <laughs> <And> <laughs> if you just, had a catch-all chant, you just had to do the action. Yeah, and then they're just like sitting there, just being like, "Oh, for fuck's sake!" Can you just, <laughs> oh, I just need you to like get to the devil shit. You know, I'm just sick of hearing this chant. And now you do it with a hand on your head and a hand on the sole of your foot. <laughs> that would be funny. Hmm. She also... This was weird to me because I'd never heard this before. And I don't know if it's localised to Highland witches or witches just of the Aldern area. Mm-hmm. I think it might have just been the Aldern area. Aldern's pretty small too. It is, but it was... It was like a like a focal point. I don't really know why, but yeah. she was saying that witches from this area couldn't transform into doves or lambs. Hmm. Those were the two things they couldn't transform into. So she had chance for transforming into rabbits and hares and cats. Jackdaws was mm-hmm. another one, but not doves and lambs. Not doves or lambs. And I do wonder if it's because of the biblical references well, to both. I was just thinking that they're both. It's quite significant in the Bible. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So I thought that was interesting. That her, was interesting. There's a historian called Emma Wilby who's written a big book about this, which I really want to get. And she talks a lot about how her confessions are really interesting and really unique because they're a blend of religious references and folklore references. Mm. It's kind of a mishmash of both. And the way that she's combined them is unique to her. This implies she was quite well educated. Well, it does, doesn't it? Like, surely, I mean, she could have picked this up somewhere else. But remember, she could have been a good storyteller without knowing how to read or write. Yeah, that's true. Because oral storytelling storytelling traditions are really prevalent through throughout Scotland, anyway, and across the world. Yeah, I think I was thinking of illiterate more as like a... A sense of being dumb. Unintelligent. Yeah, as in like deaf and dumb, that kind of dumb. But yeah, it could just be the technical skills mm-hmm. rather than any mental capacity. Because being should. being literate is a fairly modern phenomenon. Yeah. It is, isn't it? Like up until the late eighteen hundreds you had to be fairly wealthy or a man to get a full education. Yeah. Weird. Mm-hmm. Isabel told the commission that the devil crafted elf arrowheads with his own two hands and he gave them to each of the witches and each of the witches got their own number of these arrowheads and they could fire them by flicking their thumbs. They were so small that they didn't have a have a bow, they just sat on their thumb and they flicked <laughs> them. And Very cool. She said, we have no bow to shoot with but spang them from our from off our thumbnails. Sometimes we'll miss, but if they touch, be it beast or man or woman, it will kill them, mm-hmm. even if they had a coat of mail on them. Oh. And she admitted to killing two people with these arrowheads in these confessions. Oh, dear. She said she killed a farmer because the arrowhead went through a plough and hit him and said that she killed a woman. Damn. Mm-hmm. Just by this little flick with the elf arrowhead. Flick. Right. You got me. Oh. <laughs> So, you know, she's confessing to murder. Oh, well, yeah. What, what is what is happening? Mm-hmm. I told you this was wild. I mean, you did. You promised have delivered, and I'm still surprised. She warned everyone who was listening to her that, quote, if any of the witches come into your house or are set to do you evil, they will look strange, misshapen, dishevelled, with their clothes sticking out, unquote. And, you know, I'm paraphrasing. There's a lot more detail and a lot more things that she confessed to doing with the other witches in, in her coven. Yeah. So where where are these other witches? Are they also... Well, one of them is being... One of them is confessing sort of alongside Isabel. Not at the same time, but like they've, they've been detained together. Uh-huh. And she's called Janet Breadhead. <laughs> <laughs> But Janet was also confessing. And I was going to include some of the details from her confession, but she says almost word for word exactly what Isabel says in her confessions. Ooh, that's weird. Mm -hmm. I demand that you refer to her as Ms. Breadhead. No, (laughs) because I'll just laugh. (laughs) 
completely ruins the tone. <laughs> that's weird. So that's happening at the same time, but they're not confessing in front of the group together. Interesting. If that makes sense. But they're confessing separately. As if they've rehearsed or have been doing all these things. Yeah, because I was going to read out the differences to sort of compare what uh-huh. we were saying, but they're they're almost identical. That's wild. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know about the others. The others are either not confessing or haven't been arrested yet. I'm not sure. <laughs> And they're like, oh, I can't handle 13 of these broads all in here. <laughs> well, there were a couple of men. Oh. The apologies. the main difference with Janet's story, actually, was that she was introduced to witchcraft by her husband and his mother. Oh. That she had never been involved until her husband sort of made her join in with what they were doing. Interesting. And the clay figure yep. was made in their house. Oh. So they... He got he stole the bit of clay from his work and she broke it into pieces and made the little figurine. Damn. Yeah. So he he was supposedly in the coven. He was involved. Her husband. I think John Taylor was his name. Oh wow. Well. I'm pretty sure Alder would only have had thirteen people in it. <laughs> <laughs> pretty sure I was looking up on Google Maps and it's a few streets. Yeah, it's not very big. <gasps> but then I'll be there. The area, won't it? Yeah, yeah. Kind of like Highlands. It's a huge area. Yeah, everyone, everything kind of sprawls out here, doesn't it? Yeah. You can be in an area of a town, but not in the town. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. The powers that be didn't have all that long to wait for their next instalment from Isabel. Confession number three here came, we go again. It came on the 15th of May, less than oh. two weeks later. So she's she's been a, in prison for about a month. And this is her third confession. Well, let's, let's hear it. <laughs> well, see, with this one and the fourth one, I couldn't find a transcription. Okay. I don't know if I need to like buy a copy or go through like a National Museum archive or something. Oh. I couldn't find it anywhere. But from what I can find, what people have written about the confessions... Mm-hmm. The third one was the most salacious and scandalous <laughs> because Isabel detailed having sex with the devil herself in a lot of detail. <laughs> um, and she also talked at length about the times that the other members of her coven had had sex with the devil. It's all very pornographic. It is. It's, like, it's so <laughs> bizarre to read about something like this from that time period. <laughs> But she also took a lot of time, apparently, I haven't read it, to describe the devil's genitalia hmm. at length. <laughs> Maybe there was a lot to describe. Maybe, I, Maybe I don't know, know I mean. but she spent a lot of time talking about it. Damn. I'm almost kind of glad I haven't read it. I know. Come on, it was forked. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> We're not talking about it. <laughs> In this confession, she also told a thrilling tale of being transformed into a hare by the devil. So I mentioned that before. Mm -hmm. And he did this because she had to run an errand for him. That would be fastest. Mm -hmm. But while she was a hare, she was chased by a pack of dogs. That that would be a drawback. See, it's a problem. That's why I don't want to do it. Well, you've, yeah, learned from her mistakes. See? But she was lucky because according to her... The dogs could bite her while she was a hare, but because she was a shapeshifter, they couldn't kill her. Oh. So she... Useful. ...had to wait until she had an opportunity to get far enough away and say the chant, and then she'd become a human mm-hmm. again, <clears throat> which is what she did. So she didn't die, but she had to suffer the bite marks and the scars that were left behind. Oh, Because although they couldn't kill her, they could leave scars uh-huh. on her body. I'm definitely, next time, because there's a few rabbits around here, I'm going to be looking at them, just checking, see if oh, there's yeah. any, like, chanting. Chanting, or are you chanting right now? I wonder what the differences are. Are you doing a funny little dance? I wonder how you could differentiate. A, a witch hair from an actual hair, or yeah. a hair from a... Yeah, I wonder. A marking, like with an animagus in Harry Potter. A pointy hat. <laughs> <laughs> That one was riding a broom. <laughs> Oversized boots. 
Yeah, you know, lots of acting shifty. Mm. Mm-hmm. I would say around here, the shiftiest animals that we have are the pigeons and the pheasants. That's true. They keep trying to break in. That's true. Sneaking into the garden. And the rabbits haven't been much of an issue. No. There was that badger we saw run across the road <clears> that made <throat> him up to no good. I mean, I don't think he was up to no good. He was just on his merry way. We interrupted him, if anything. We, yeah, we were badgering him, if anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Because it's, it's late. It is late. It is late. I don't know if you remember, but turning into a hare to do the devil's bidding is something that crops up in the stories that come from Pendle Hill. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> There's really famous witch trials that happened in Pendle Hill down in Lancashire in England. Mm -hmm. So it's not really in our remit for the podcast. But these happened in the early 1600s. So before all of this with Isabel. But I'm sure it's in that story it happens that the women turn into hares and they do the devil's bidding. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, It's not really... I don't know if it's something we could cover on the podcast because it's an English story. But... It's really gripping. It's worth looking into. Yeah. But I thought that was interesting, that it's a common thread. Yeah. I wonder, because they could have heard about it. Maybe. I, I don't know how far-reaching things like that were, news-wise. Yeah. I mean, if it's a good story, it'll travel, won't it? Mm-hmm. Well, I think with Agnes Sampson, pamphlets were published. Oh, yeah. That detailed what she had done and then what happened to her. Well, but they took a lot because we saw one of the pamphlets at the National Museum. Oh shit! So we did. They had one, and I'm sure it was a thing. It got published and like handed around, but it was full of things that didn't actually happen. Well, it's just propaganda, isn't mm-hmm. it? If it was done to make well, it's not the even prop- it's not even look good. Well, no, it's not even propaganda. It's like gossip. Oh, it's kind of like a tabloid. So Ooh. the stories embellished and added to and made more scandalous. So I was saying in the last episode that they wrote in that pamphlet that they found the devil's mark on her privates. Oh, yeah. Which never happened. But they wrote about it. Weird. And it painted her out to be worse than she was. Yeah. So maybe they did. Yeah, yeah. That was very gossiply, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pretty grim. It's grim. Isabel's last confession, so her fourth confession... Uh-huh came on the 27th of May. So her first one was the 13th of April. And this is six weeks later. Yep. It's a long time. Yeah. Like she's... To be detained. Yeah. She doesn't get to go home every night. No. Awaiting whether or not you're going to get a trial. Yeah. Not even awaiting trial. But even... I, I don't even know if it would have worked differently if she had just said, like, I'm finished. You know, after the first one. Yeah. I don't know. Weird. But basically she had given all of these confessions and she had a rapt audience for all of them. <laughs> they were completely taken in by what she had to say. And like I said, all of her confessions were paired with and backed up by what Janet said. Well, it's going to be literally the most interesting thing you'll have ever heard. Yeah. Like, absolutely bananas. Like, right. well, there's not entertainment there is in the way there is now like that's just gonna like you're gonna hear all these stories and be like holy shit Mm -hmm. it's a madness now i know you just said that you're not sure if even 15 people lived in aldern at that time oh yeah but as a result of these statements that these two women made 41 other people were arrested woofed now they weren't all executed or anything like that but they were all arrested and considering uh, how small a place like that is, that is a lot of people. That is a lot. Jeez, Hill. So, what are your bets for what happened after Isabel's confessions? Uh, she gave her confessions. Mm-hmm. They were all like, what the hell is this? Oh, well, we'll just send this <laughs> off to the privy. What the hell? What the hell? They sent it off to the privy. They were like, well, yeah, I think I think we should get her get her a trial. And then they were like, sweet, well, you admitted to murdering some people and having sex with the devil. It's, it's a pretty short trial. Then she was executed. Okay. How annoyed are you going to be if I tell you that we don't know what happened to her? Oh. Oh, man. Can you give me blue balls like that? <laughs> 
You think we have historical blue balls? <laughs> I mean, it's the best kind, I guess. Mm-hmm. We don't know. How... There's two. There's two of her written confessions, but no record of what happened to her. Well, all four confessions exist. I just couldn't find online versions of the third and fourth. So all four have been recorded and written down. Recorded, written down, kept safe for 400 years. And they're like, oh, what happened to her? I didn't write it down. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, mate. Yeah, weird. Who you think someone would remember? Well, it's annoying and it's frustrating, but we don't know for sure what happened to her after this. <sighs> we just don't. The records that were supposed to lay out what happened after the confessions, so, you know, everything that came after the trial, Uh, the outcome of the trial, everything like that, doesn't exist anymore. So, we don't know what happened to her. I think she turned into a hare and escaped. (laughs) And took all the documentation with her. (laughs) She's She's got a little satchel and a little hat, and she's just... Booking it. As a sort of Peter Rabbit situation. And then she's just off. <laughs> <laughs> or she's nibbling through it all. Out of Farmer McGregor's garden. Yeah. Well, Emma Wilby, who I mentioned before, she's the historian who's written the book that I want to buy. She has a theory for what she believes is most likely to have happened. And I'm inclined to believe her, A, because it's kind of what I thought happened to her anyway. Uh-huh. And B, because she's written a book about Isabel Gowdy, so... That's a good authority. She's an historian. I'm I'm a fraud. <laughs> <laughs> so... I'm just a goober. <laughs> is fraud above goober? Or is I, goober above fraud? I think so. If she's a historian, you're pretending to be a, pretending to be a historian. I guess I'm sitting here pretending to be into history. <laughs> <laughs> well... Emma Wilby believes that they sent off the confessions and then the commission to have the trial was granted. So the people down Edinburgh looked at all the evidence and said, yes, there's enough to have a trial. Here you go. I mean, it seems, from what you said, that seems a pretty pretty clear-cut case. Yeah, like I, I would have thought so. It didn't take much to convict someone of being a witch. Yeah. And she just handed it to them on a plate. Yeah. So all of this documentation would have been taken back to Aldern. So remember, this is the 1660s, so it would have taken a while to get the doc- the paperwork to Edinburgh and back. Yep, yep. Okay? Yep. So they believe that all of this was brought back to Aldern. Isabel and Janet would have been tried, because they were allowed to, yep. and found guilty. And Wilby thinks this happened sort of mid July. So yeah, they, they think or Wilby thinks this happened sort of mid July. Mid July. So, so that's her May. last confession was the end of May. End of May. End of, oh damn, mid July. Yeah. So it takes time. Yep. So if they're found guilty, which chances are they probably would have been, because there was a lot of ev- or evidence. Evidence. Against them. Well, they'd confess to it, just sitting there. Yeah. So they would have been transported from where they were being held along probably a bumpy road on a wooden cart to Gallow Hill, just outside Nairn. And God knows what was going through their minds at this point. What on earth could you think? Yeah. So then it's really likely that their punishment would have been delivered, which would have been being strangled to death and then burned at the stake, just like Agnes Sampson was. Horrendous. Yeah. So this this seems like the most likely outcome. Given what happened to most people who were accused of witchcraft, I think it's quite likely that this would have happened to them. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately. It's got to be like a 99% chance. That's the that's the general. I'd say, I'd say it's a good chance. Yeah. With the only discrepancies being like, oh, well, maybe they got hung instead. Yeah. You know. But there's no there's no good outcome. But it's spooky when you consider that happening just down the road from us. That is. I wonder where Gallo Hill is. Hmm. I don't know if they kept track of things like that. I don't know if they would have written down where it was. They would have needed to, really. Because they would have known. 
Well, that and quite often, if people were executed, they were just buried on site in like unmarked oh. graves. So they might not have written it down. Yeah. I'm sure that's a thing. It might not have been yeah. the case here. I, I don't know, but I, I'm sure I've read about that happening generally. Because yeah. they're, they're executed criminals, so yeah. they just bury them anywhere. Now, this seems the most likely thing to have happened, but there are a couple of other theories. No? If you do care to hear them. I do love a good theory. So some people believe that the woman might have been spared because they could have been labelled mentally impaired oh, yeah. for everything that they confessed to. I and mean, it's pretty barmy. Yeah, and I think just the willingness to confess it all would... Yeah. It's kind of like Catch-22, oh, you know, yeah. where like they they have to be crazy not to fly. But if they admit they're crazy, they're not crazy. So they have to fly. Yeah. But you'd have to be crazy to... You know, it's that thing. So maybe it was like that. The fact that they confess to it at all means that they aren't witches. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Another theory suggests that they might just have been freed completely because it depends what was sent back with the commission. <laughs> so it could have come back and said, there's not enough evidence, you can't have a trial. Maybe. They have to be released. Maybe. So they could have been allowed just to go home. Like, there is a chance, because we d- we don't know. There's a chance. Wouldn't that be wild if they just got to go home like nothing had happened? <laughs> yeah, like they spend that uh, two or three months in prison... And then just like, okay, you're clean. Or just like... Stay out of trouble. Head home. The way that her confessions have shaped so much after her, for her to just just go home. Yeah. It it would be madness. It would be madness. So she's she's really an enigma from beginning to end. Yeah. She flashes into history from nowhere and then she just disappears again. Bizarre. Absolutely bizarre. Maybe they all, like, she shouted the go word and then they all took out their elf arrows, killed all their captors and then escaped. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Maybe it's a chance. Maybe. Maybe. We don't know, so we can just make some of that. <laughs> well, I want to talk a bit about what made Isabel say what she did. Okay. Before we finish. Do you have any thoughts on why she made these confessions? Um, no. Gen- no. <laughs> general generally baffled yeah no idea why on earth she did that apart from accidentally ate some magic mushrooms but then you know why would you continue to do so over the next six weeks oh yeah over a course that long yeah four weeks well a few suggestions have been put forward to try and explain it because i think a lot of people are like you they just don't they don't understand why she did it i'm just i'm i'm too shocked because she would have known what happened to people accused of witchcraft she wouldn't have been that out of it even living so remote like everyone knew so one theory suggests that Isabel just had an incredible imagination and she was a very talented storyteller. Mm-hmm. So she'd gotten used to telling stories for families and friends and just groups of people and she loved doing it and she loved having people listen to her tell a story. So people think that she started like weaving this big story about witchcraft and being a witch purely because she had people listening. Yeah. And they were holding on to her every word, so she just kept going and kept going until it was bigger than she even planned it to be. (laughs) I can fully see that of the the old crone version of her in her 50s, just spinning a yarn. (laughs) (laughs) So my husband won't listen to me, so you guys have to do. Yeah, just like, just full on, just taking the piss and having a great time. So like, well, I'm damned if I do and I'm damned if I don't, so I'm just going to fucking have you well, see along that theory there was a historian I think it's called John Callow he thought that she might have done it purely to torment the minister <laughs> because he hated witchcraft so the local local minister she just did it to wind him up <laughs> so maybe maybe another theory is that Isabel was suffering from some kind of psychosis mm-hmm. and just wasn't really in control and she was having an episode uh, mentally and Mm -hmm. just she was having hallucinations and things and and wasn't in control of what she was saying so that's another theory but impossible to prove Mm -hmm. similar to this theory 
is that Isabel was suffering from something called ergotism. Have you heard this word before? I've not heard this word. Well, basically, I have only heard about it because I've read about the Salem witch trials. And I think that ergotism might have been responsible for those two. Hmm. So it's kind of a common thing when you think of <clears throat> witch hunt hysteria. Ergotism is blamed. And basically it's an illness you get from eating rye or like grain, mm -hmm. which has been infected with a specific type of fungus. So it's basically a poison. It's really bad. I saw some photos of what grain looks like when it has ergot. Mm -hmm. And you can see it. There's like individual grains in this big bag that have gone completely black. And they're the ones that have the fungus on them. And the problem comes from mixing these grains, which are bad, in with all the other grain mm. and using it. Because when it's eaten, it does all these crazy things to your body. Bad apple spoils a bunch. Pretty much in a big way with this. The symptoms of ergotism aren't great. So this is just this is just WebMD. Uh, you can suffer from nausea, vomiting, muscle pain, muscle weakness, numbness, itching, a rapid or a slow heartbeat, gangrene, blindness, confusion, hallucinations, spasms, convulsions, unconsciousness, and death. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. So it could be that Isabel was suffering from ergotism, from mm. bad grain that she had eaten and was having hallucinations yeah. and all these experiences and couldn't describe them any other way. Because if everyone believes that witches are real and witchcraft is real and the devil is real, if you have a hallucination, that might be what you see. Yeah, it makes sense. And if you're horny as balls, then you're just <laughs> going to be doing it. <laughs> So it, it could be. Could be. The last theory I have, um, it comes with a trigger warning for sexual assault. Mm -hmm. So if you're listening to this and you want to just skip the next few minutes, then I totally understand. Just like skip ahead a bit. Um, I'm not going to be going into any detail or anything, but it is going to be mentioned. So some historians believe that the tough life that Isabel lived led her to find comfort in a fantasy world where she had more control. So she talks often about these huge, beautiful, delicious meals that she had oh, yeah. with the devil and with the coven and with the fairies, which suggests someone who is always hungry. Yeah. If, if this is what she has... If we assume she's imagined it, mm -hmm. if this is what she's imagining that she was doing... It suggests someone who doesn't have enough. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's likely that Isabel survived the Battle of Aldern, which happened in 1645. Oh, yeah. And this was a part of the English Civil War. And after it, oh. soldiers remained in the area. Um, and, uh, trigger warning, in her confessions, she details her first sexual encounter ever as happening in 1647 with the devil. <clears throat> And records show that rape was a recurrent crime that happened in periods of hostility or uncertainty yeah. and unrest. So it's very possible that with that battle having happened and her saying that this is when she had sex with the devil, it could be possible that she created the story as a way of dealing with her trauma of yeah. being assaulted. And this was the only way that she could deal with the pain, was just creating this this fantasy story instead. Jeez, love. So it's very possible. Very possible. Unfortunately, I think, you know, there is a chance. Uh -huh. But it's very sad. It is very sad. And I'd never heard of the Battle of Aldern before. No. So I looked into it very briefly because I didn't want to talk about it too, too much. Mm -hmm. But it happened when Scottish royalists, who were supporters of King Charles the First or the Second clashed with the Covenanter army. So it's just a part of the civil war. But what was interesting was that apparently the casualties were buried in a forest near Aldern that's called Dead Man's Wood. Oh. Ooh, air. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a legal requirement that that place be haunted. <laughs> 
I mean, it has to be. Right? Yeah, oh man. But there's also a dove cot that stands on the site of the battle, mm-hmm. which is there today. So that's what I was talking about at the start. Like, that's something that you can go visit, it mm-hmm. still exists, but I don't know if there are any memorials to Isabel or anyone. Not if they don't know what happened to her, I suppose. No, but I know that exists, that's there. But the impact of Isabel's confessions have just been massive in the study of witch hunts and the witch trials. Like she's a huge figure in that like corner of history. Mm. She was massively influential. And her story gained fame and popularity when the transcripts of her confessions were rediscovered. Oh yeah. So they were found and then published by a historian called called Robert Pitcairn in 1833. Wow. So it was a long time after. Yeah. And he basically just found them tucked into an archive by accident yeah. and started reading them and couldn't believe what he was reading. Jeez, oh. And there's sections of them that have just been eaten by like mice. So there's some parts that are incomplete because mm. it was eaten. And people were just as enthralled in the 1800s as they were in the 1600s at reading her accounts. And I think you can buy copies of the version that he published. Wow. I'm sure that's a thing. But yeah, 1833. 1833. Yeah. 150 more than that. Jeez, Just by accident. Crazy. Just amazing event. Mm Mm-hmm. But more recently... Her stories inspired books, poems, plays. There's a song by a band called the Sensational Alex Harvey Band called Isabel Gowdy. That's about her. But there's one thing in particular that's been inspired by her story that we've talked about that I just think is incredible. And it's James McMillan's symphony? Yeah, I think so. Symphony arrangement? Symphony piece. That he wrote for the proms. And it's called The Confession of Isabel Gowdy, and it was released in 1990, and it's it's beautiful. It's really good. It's an amazing piece of music. I'd highly recommend listening to it. It's like 25 minutes long. Yeah. It's on Spotify. It's incredible. Spotify, I found it on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Um, I found a video of the Spanish TV and radio orchestra playing it. Yeah. But it's incredible. And he wrote it as a a sort of tribute to her, Mm. as a requiem for her, and the piece that she didn't get in her life because he he assumes that she was burned mm-hmm. so that's Fair that's what his inspiration is but it's an amazing piece of music mm. absolutely loved it yeah it's new area it was phenomenal one thing i did find which i didn't really agree with while i was searching for all the things that are isabel gowdy inspired there's a woman on etsy who's from down in england who was selling all during graveyard dirt and i don't know how i feel about it I feel like that's not cool. Yeah. How the hell are you doing that for? Oh, God. Yeah. Grim. Yeah. That is that's completely fucked. So, you know, you can you can do it one way, or you can do it another. I just thought that was a bit weird. Yeah, that's pretty weird. <laughs> but that is the incredible story of Isabel Gowdy Jeez, and her so confessions. Wild. Madness. All the madness you expect from a witch. Mm-hmm. I feel like, you know, she was still in, in a bad position where mm. she was locked up and suspected of all these things, but there's something about her story that makes her seem like she had so much more agency than a lot of people accused of being witches mm-hmm. that I've ever heard about. Yeah, absolutely. She seems so much more in control, mm-hmm. but her motives are baffling. I know. I wish there was more information. And the fact that she just vanishes yeah, is astounding to me. Which makes sense if all that really exists are these transcripts mm-hmm. and the like details accompanying them. And it's not even like they didn't keep records of what happened to her, they just didn't keep them. Yeah. I think from what I was reading, it happened a lot with local records. So small places, mm-hmm. things just weren't kept. It's all the same rage I get reading about the Roman philosophers. And how all their works got burnt. Oh, yeah. Well, I got such and such wrote 47 books, and they were all burnt except this one section of a poem. And that's why you get to know about them. Like, oh, man. <laughs> I don't know. I, I like to think that somehow 
she didn't get executed. That's a nicer, nicer thing to think, isn't it? I like to think it. Purely because everything else about her story is so mad mm-hmm. that it wouldn't surprise me if for some reason the commission came back and they were like, nope, can't have a trial. Yeah. Or some mad harebrained scheme. Yeah. It would not surprise me even no. a little bit. Well, thus ends part two. Mm-hmm. Two out of three. Two out of three ain't bad. Man, I'm just, I'm just reeling. I, just, I, know, I don't even seem, know. You seem so quiet. It's because I don't, I just... Can you not deal? No, it's just too bizarre. I can't comprehend it to have any sort of opinion other than <laughs> mental. <laughs> well, I thought it was so interesting to research and read about and then it was quite a joy to tell it to you because it's just such an incredible story. But I'm looking forward to episode three. Episode three. The final part of our mini series. Episode three. And then you're going to have to cope without us for another couple of months. Until we return again. Mm-hmm. Right. Stop listening to us yabber on. Go listen to episode three. Yeah. Right, right now. Cool. You don't need to listen to intro music. No. Again, you know what it is. You know like. what it is. It's the same every time. Yeah, you heard it at the start. Yeah. If you didn't skip it. Because, you know, we consume our content by binging it. So you yeah. have to listen to all three of these episodes all at once. Obviously. Go on. Then back to the start of episode one again. <laughs> Bye.